Alan McDonald. I'm here to speak uh, today about Lyme borreliosis from the uh, point of view of autopsy published studies, uh, literature cases that describe a carefully documented autopsy proof of chronic Lyme disease, and uh, to discuss the widening spectrum of Lyme disease in year 2014. Uh, at the end, I will provide some technical guidelines which will be of assistance to pathologists who are interested in doing Lyme-focused autopsies to further expand the uh, menu choices for the way that Lyme disease may impact the human host and the way that it can cause disease, disability, and death. I've reviewed uh, 6,000 cases from the um, published literature, and uh, from this review I've extracted 123 cases, uh, all autopsy reports from authors uh, from international laboratories, and uh, the survey of my literature uh, begins in 1983 and ends in the year 2013. Uh, the morbidities, that is the um, chronic conditions, uh, not terminating in death, exceed uh, Lyme borreliosis mortalities or deaths and then autopsy uh, by a fairly large percentage. And good faith uh, estimates of morbidities due to um, Lyme disease uh, will be uh, discussed in this tape. We'll also try to uh, point out cases where opportunities to underdiagnose Lyme borreliosis, uh, Lyme neuroborreliosis, that's LNB, Lyme neuroborreliosis, uh, and uh, Lyme fetal borreliosis, um, and Lyme uh, chronic borreliosis, that's LCB, uh, in um, current health practice. So all these uh, topics will be uh, addressed in the uh, video which follows. Veterinary uh, patients are also uh, sentinels. Uh, and by sentinels, we in medicine mean that uh, sentinels are the first evidence of disease. Uh, when you have a sentinel event, it's the first event of its type. Uh, if you're looking for possible spread of cancer from one area of the body to uh, others, you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. That's the lymph node that's closest to the area where the cancer is. And if the sentinel lymph node uh, is negative, it is uh, reassuring that the cancer may not have spread. Veterinary doctors now are regularly diagnosing Lyme disease in their patients or tick-borne disease in their patients. And their patients are small animals and large animals. It's ironic that in some countries, uh, veterinary doctors have seen a lot of Lyme disease in animals, and uh, human uh, patient care doctors are not seeing uh, Lyme or tick-borne diseases. So there's a disconnect between the veterinary experience and the human experience. We want to close that gap. We want to learn from each other. Veterinarians are uh, very important uh, health uh, providers and uh, they have a lot of information to uh, share with uh, human health providers in identifying infectious diseases in the community. I have uh, put onto YouTube three uh, films, they're all free, and uh, part one and part two are uh, devoted to autopsy borreliosis literature citations. Uh, they cover all of the 123 autopsy cases, which I've been able to find up until year 2013. Uh, part three is a uh, film which deals with autopsy borreliosis guidelines for the Borrelia-focused autopsy, and that is to help you and your patients uh, if you want to undertake uh, such a specialized examination. It's a time-consuming process. It takes practice. It takes controls. And uh, it's not as easily accomplished as uh, the usual autopsy in which uh, infection is not sought or uh, thought of as a part of the examination. 
The Centers for Disease Control in year 2014 reported three adults who had died suddenly of cardiac deaths, and each of those deaths was ultimately found to be due to Borrelia myocarditis. All the uh, deaths were in young uh, adults. All of them uh, were uh, visited by the organ donor uh, harvest transplant team. All their uh, organs were harvested uh, before uh, any further transplantation was done. Uh, forensic pathologists examined tissues from the um, patients who had died. And in three of these uh, cases, they found that the uh, heart uh, was extensively inflamed and that there was uh, evidence of Borrelia infection in the heart. So then all of the um, potential uh, organ uh, donation procedures were canceled because it's not proper to transplant into anybody tissues which are infected, uh, immunosuppression and anti-transplantation rejection um, would make uh, infections in any of the transplanted organs uh, grow very quickly and potentially kill the host. In uh, uh, Australia, we had a case where a uh, court ordered an autopsy to prove the existence of Lyme borreliosis as the cause of death. And this is the famous case of Carl McManus. Uh, in Australia, now there is the Carl McManus Foundation to uh, further research into Lyme disease. The reason the court had to order the autopsy in Australia was that it was generally believed by health authorities that there was no Lyme disease in Australia. Carl McManus became uh, ill and died uh, as a result of uh, his um, life in Australia, exposure to uh, a tick which transmitted the disease uh, probably in an area uh, northeast of uh, Sydney in the Queensland area. Um, the autopsy showed that the organs were riddled with spirochetes. So it was proven by a forensic autopsy that the cause of death for Carl McManus was Lyme disease, overwhelming the infection, and it established a bench benchmark for the health authority in Australia to understand that Lyme disease is indeed a public health problem in Australia. Uh, hydrocephalus uh, is one of the findings that uh, I have found and others have found in some patients who have died from chronic Lyme disease involving the brain. Hydrocephalus is uh, water on the brain, a filling of the ventricles of the brain with extra cerebrospinal fluid, compression and reduction of the mass of the brain in some areas becomes paper thin. And as the brain, uh, solid tissue shrinks and the fluid in the ventricles, cerebrospinal fluid increases, uh, the patient becomes more and more incapacitated. So at this time, we have uh, adult hydrocephalus uh, cases, a most conspicuously one from Dr. Ligner, very carefully examined by autopsy, uh, fe fetal hydrocephalus due to Lyme infection of the brain uh, from my series and also from a case in Turkey, uh, recently published, and then normal pressure hydrocephalus uh, case from Stony Brook. So Lyme disease uh, may cause hydrocephalus and it does that by blocking uh, some of the channels which allow the spinal fluid to be uh, reabsorbed and into the body. And the scarring and inflammation cause that uh, process to be blocked. So the spinal fluid continues to be produced and it uh, compresses the brain and re results in disability. High grade uh, malignant lymphomas uh, induced by Lyme disease in the nervous system have been found in European autopsies. We have not found such lymphomas here yet. Uh, we really haven't looked for them. Uh, High-grade malignant lymphomas uh, arising in the brain are unusual occurrences. Lyme disease does have the ability to penetrate and to parasitize lymph lymphocytes and lymphoid cells and other cells of the immune system. So it's not inconceivable that Lyme disease infection might induce an uncontrolled growth of lymphoma, uh, and uh, that lymphoma would involve the uh, lymphoid uh, elements, the lymphoid cells of the body. Uh, acute respiratory distress has been uh, repeatedly documented uh, with fatality, and uh, Lyme disease then in the lung can cause 
uh, fatal outcome. Uh, it's an overwhelming uh, compromise of the lungs. Uh, both sides were involved. Uh, early uh, reports of this came from Dr. Paul DeRay. Uh, he had cases uh, due to both uh, Borreliosis and to combined infections with Borreliosis and Babesiosis. Babesiosis and Borreliosis usually confer a more difficult disease and may have a worse outcome, including uh, increased likelihood of uh, death. Fatal uh, disease in the brain with loss of myelin has been reported. Again, uh, with Dr. Ligner's case, uh, we have uh, several cases of um, fatal uh, brain disease involving Borrelia infection with loss of myelin. Uh, this raises the uh, uh, companion uh, situation of uh, multiple sclerosis. Parkinson's disease uh, related to Lyme disease has been described again by Dr. Paul DeRay, uh, another infection uh, which uh, heretofore has been thought to be uh, primary neurodegeneration. Now we have an infectious cause for Parkinson's disease. It's not inconceivable that an infection could cause a Parkinsonian illness because uh, there is an entity after uh, some forms of influenza called uh, post-influenza encephalitic Parkinson's disease, and it comes uh, with some influenza epidemics and uh, leaves Parkinson's as a, uh, a residual uh, disease after the influenza has uh, cleared up in the, uh, in the patient. Fetal death in utero, uh, this is a uh, work uh, from uh, many uh, international authors. Uh, one mil uh, spirochete crosses the placenta. It uh, will then infect the uh, placenta and the fetus. And in some situations, the fetus will die before a birth, uh, resulting in miscarriage. My initial studies in Lyme disease uh, were studies of uh, Lyme-related uh, uh, fetal infection with death and miscarriage, and I reported these in 1985. Since that time, investigators from around the world, most recently Dr. Lakos in Slovenia, have uh, continued to emphasize the importance of uh, transplacental uh, transmission of Lyme disease infection from mother to baby, resulting in fetal death or adverse fetal outcome. Neonatal deaths in the first week of life are another extension of Lyme disease uh, developing in the uh, developing fetus well uh, in the uterus before birth and then uh, becoming clinically a problem after the patient has been born. In the first week of life, uh, a uh, fetal death was reported in 1985 and other uh, neonatal fetal deaths have since been re recorded. So uh, here again, a, a delayed uh, what we call tardive, uh, delayed manifestation of intrauterine infection due to the Lyme disease spirochete crossing the placenta and infecting the fetus and causing an adverse uh, fatal outcome in the first week of life. Uh, to take it uh, a few steps further, we have the sudden infant death group of cases where uh, babies that appear to be uh, normal at the time of birth uh, die suddenly in the first uh, three months of life. Uh, these in uh, autopsy studies uh, by me have uh, been uh, proven to be due to Lyme disease, uh, spirochetes infecting the brain and other organs. Strokes are related to Lyme disease. Uh, they may be uh, cerebral uh, vasculitis or infl inflammation of the blood vessels or thrombotic strokes. Uh, that's blockage of the vessels by a thrombus. Uh, either type of stroke is possible. Uh, these have been most often described in European patients. Uh, we have not looked very hard in the U.S. for Lyme-related strokes. Uh, I think more work needs to be done in this area. And remember, either inflammation of the vessel with narrowing of the vessel and then reduced blood flow causing stroke or out-and-out -out clotting of the vessel with termination of blood flow resulting in stroke, two mechanisms for Lyme-related strokes. Life-altering Borreliosis, um, this is a group of uh, cases 
which I will describe. And uh, all of these will have uh, blue uh, panel um, identification, so you won't confuse them with the autopsy cases that I have just uh, described. Uh, Life-altering borreliosis is uh, morbidity. Uh, morbidity is uh, usually a health condition which is serious enough to change your life. And uh, some morbidities are so severe that the patients who have them wish that they were dead. Uh, giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis is one of these morbidities. I first described this in 1987 in a, uh, a physician who uh, had blindness. Uh, subsequently, uh, three cases have been described uh, and the, they refer to my uh, pioneering work in 1987. The Karolinska Institute had three such cases of giant cell arteritis. Osteomyelitis uh, is another uh, chronic condition which may be induced by Lyme infection and may cause bone pain and uh, loss of bone stability. It's a chronic condition always. And uh, it is a probable biofilm uh, problem for the people who have Lyme osteomyelitis. Cardiomyopathy due to chronic Lyme infection was described first by Dr. Stanek in 1990 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, the cardiomyopathy is a dilated uh, enlargement of the heart, so the pumping action of the heart is reduced. Patients go into heart failure. Uh, some of these patients have been conservatively managed. Uh, some have been treated with antibiotics, some have not. Uh, one case had such severe heart failure that it required cardiac transplantation. So that's the uh, one case at the bottom requiring cardiac transplantation. Endocrine dysfunctions of either uh, thyroid gland, pituitary, or adrenal, uh, or all of the above uh, endocrine glands have been described in Lyme infection in some patients. So they will have a, a complicated endocrine abnormality picture, and it uh, takes a, a lot of expertise to uh, figure out what the problem is and then to effectively treat such patients. Hepatitis is uh, another uh, situation where Lyme disease uh, may show clinical disease. There may be scarring. Uh, we don't know whether there will be cirrhosis. We do have recent, a recent report. Uh, I'm co-author co on this report, uh, along with Dr. Middleveen and Dr. Stricker, in the year 2014 of autoimmune hepatitis-like uh, presentation. Now, autoimmune hepatitis is uh, a disease which uh, can progress to uh, death and uh, it is usually treated with uh, steroids and with methotrexate to try to stop the immune system from damaging the liver. In the uh, case which uh, Dr. Middleveen, uh, colleagues, and Dr. Stricker uh, um, published in 2014, it came to them as autoimmune hepatitis, and they had a suspicion to check for evidence of Lyme infection. They found antibodies in the blood. They did a liver biopsy, they did special stains, and they found that the spirochetes were present in the liver in the areas of the hepatitis. We proved it with DNA uh, uh, probes specific for Borrelia. So uh, this now uh, places other cases which are uh, carried as autoimmune hepatitis into the could it be Lyme related category. If it is, uh, then uh, Antibiotics are, gen are definitely indicated, and uh, steroids and methotrexate will only make the disease worse. Heart valve infections or endocarditis. Two cases uh, in the literature, one from Strasbourg, France, and one from the Czech Republic. The organisms were European type Borrelia, one was uh, Fzalii, uh, and the Czech Republic, uh, it was Bassetti. Both were uh, confirmed uh, on examination of uh, surgically removed heart valve tissues. Uh, they were subjected to exhaustive uh, molecular analysis to prove that the DNA of Borrelia was in the damaged uh, heart valve. Total body pain syndromes are uh, oft seen or frequently seen uh, clinical presentation for Lyme patients. They're poorly understood. Uh, patients who uh, 
present to doctors who are not aware that Lyme uh, can do this, uh, will often uh, send the patients to pain management clinics or to psychiatrists because they believe it might be a psychosomatic illness. Uh, Lyme disease and uh, pain do go together and uh, total body pain syndromes are not unusual in some patients who have uh, Lyme disease, particularly in the chronic form. Motor neuron disease. Uh, this is uh, Lou Gehrig's disease like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, uh, always fatal uh, since the time of Lou Gehrig uh, when he had his diagnosis in the 1940s. Um, related conditions are primary lateral sclerosis, upper neuron, and lower motor neuron diseases. Uh, it is a disease where you have progressive uh, loss of muscle strength, abnormal muscle weak reflexes, uh, progressive inability to take care of yourself, uh, ultimately uh, inability to uh, have your diaphragm and chest wall muscles um, allow you to breathe, and then you usually die from pneumonia. Uh, after uh, an illness of uh, between three and five years. Dr. David Martz was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, uh, subsequent studies found that uh, his disease was due to Lyme Borreliosis mimicking motor neuron disease. He was cured with long-term antibiotics. And uh, he now runs an ALS clinic in Colorado Springs. He's seen 900 patients and uh, he's cured about 20 of them so far with the antibiotic program. So um, one of the very important clues to Lyme motor neuron disease, uh, like illness, and uh, motor neuron disease that is maybe not associated with Lyme is the existence of pain in the muscles that are becoming weak. The classic textbook, motor neuron disease not related to Lyme infection, never ever has pain in the muscles that are becoming weak. David Martz had severe pain in the muscles that were becoming progressively weaker. So look for evidence of pain in people who present with motor or muscle nerve weakness and come to you with a diagnosis of motor neuron disease. If there is pain, then initiate testing for Lyme disease or indicated also you can do a therapeutic trial of antibiotics to see if you can have benefit on the uh, disease as was found with Dr. Martz. He benefited, he was cured, and he is now 15 years out from his uh, original diagnosis, a fatal diagnosis of Lou Gehrig's disease. Blindness uh, can occur uh, when Lyme disease uh, infection involves the eye. It may involve the retina, so we have chorioretinitis, neuroretinitis. It may involve the uh, muscles around the eye with inflammatory disorders and lymphoma-like presentations may involve the optic nerve itself, and any of these uh, can compromise vision, and some of these can produce blindness. Autonomic nervous uh, system disease with Lyme infection is uh, increasingly diagnosed. It's hard to uh, pin down because most doctors do not think of diseases of the autonomic nervous system as being related to infection. They uh, often think that uh, it is idiopathic, which means there is no known cause, or they think that uh, the patient might have a diabetic problem because diabetes can indeed produce autonomic nervous system uh, problems. Uh, some of the symptoms are gastrointestinal. The uh, GI tract does not move well, and it may stop altogether, producing a condition called ileus. If ileus is not treated promptly, patient can develop generalized sepsis and die. It may present with orthostatic hypotension, which means that when you get up from a lying to a seated position or from a seated to a standing position, your blood pressure drops and you faint. That's because the muscles that control and regulate the uh, vascular tone, which regulates your blood pressure, are not receiving proper nerve innervation support, and uh, the vessels do not then uh, tighten up to maintain your normal blood pressure and you uh, have fainting uh, as a result. Another uh, um, presentation is anhydrosis, lack of sweating. That's an unusual condition. Most doctors would think that uh, once again you are uh, coming with a psychosomatic illness or psychiatric illness 
but in fact, the autonomic nervous system is responsible for proper regulation of sweating. And when Lyme disease involves the autonomic nervous system, uh, has been recently des uh, described in a case from Stanford University Medical Center uh, Department of Neurology, the patient came in with the uh, sole symptom of lack of sweating. So autonomic nervous system, uh, nerves damaged by Lyme infection with a complicated array of symptoms. Neuropsychiatric disorders, very common in Lyme disease. They may re uh, present from uh, a variety of uh, mechanisms and uh, they are uh, recognized by uh, neuropsychiatric uh, uh, Lyme aware psychiatrists and uh, neuropsychologists with proper testing. Uh, symptoms may include uh, attention deficit uh, disorder type uh, presentations, uh, mood disorders, uh, depression, and a variety of other neuropsychiatric conditions. Transverse myelitis is infection of the uh, spinal cord at a specific level. Uh, it is equivalent to taking a knife and cutting across the spinal cord uh, perpendicular to the uh, long axis of the body. Anything that's uh, below the level of uh, myelitis, which is inflammation of the spinal cord due to Lyme disease, uh, will have a loss of function. So you may have bilateral uh, paralysis of the legs. You may have paralysis of arms and legs. You may have uh, a variety of symptoms. Some transverse myelitis cases with Lyme disease have had the formation of a fluid cavity called a syrinx. And you recall that we opened up with hydrocephalus, which is excess fluid uh, in the brain, compressing the brain and compromising brain function. Uh, syrinx is like hydrocephalus of the spinal cord. There's a, uh, uh, an area in the center of the cord where cerebrospinal fluid will circulate. And uh, if there is problem in the integrity of that circulation, a syrinx cavity will develop. Spondylitis, uh, this is um, a type of uh, disc pain that is very common. Um, it uh, is uh, one of the manifestations in some patients with Lyme disease. It may mimic uh, disc disease symptoms, and many people who have uh, herniated uh, discs uh, seek surgical treatment to uh, remove the uh, protruding disc, which is pressing on nerve. Uh, in the spondylitis due to Lyme, the nerves are not uh, compromised by disc material pushing against it, but by the infection going into the nerve and causing pain and intervertebral disc-like symptoms. So it mimics a disc. Permanent cranial nerve dysfunctions. It means that the uh, inflammation of cranial nerves, uh, most often uh, Bell's palsy, nerve seven, um, is uh, responsible for uh, failure of those nerves and the muscles that they supply to function properly. It's thought that Bell's palsy uh, due to Lyme disease always goes away uh, on its own or with treatment. Uh, that's not true. In Europe, they found that some patients with Lyme, uh, Bell's palsy, uh, have a permanent uh, paralysis of the uh, seventh nerve, and they will have the facial muscle droop and the drooling and all the other things that go with it. Heart block. Um, heart, Lyme disease originally was uh, recognized in four uh, categories. Heart block was one of them. And uh, this was uh, due to inflammation of the nerves of the cardiac rhythm uh, conduction system. It may be temporary and have a temporary pacemaker or may be permanent and you may need a permanent pacemaker. In all of these uh, heart block uh, cases, the heart rate slows. And when the heart rate slows, uh, you may feel weak, you may feel dizzy, you may actually pass out. And if it uh, slows too much, you may actually die. So uh, pacemaker treatment is necessary for some patients. Autopsy proof then has given us uh, evidence that Lyme disease, which uh, heretofore was uh, Borrelia involving superficial sites, like skin and uh, superficial parts of the lining around the knee with arthritis and uh, uh, superficial uh, 
nerve seven with the Bell's palsy. Lyme disease now is recognized as a disease that can involve deep sites. Uh, so we have deep liver, deep brain, deep heart, the cardiomyopathy, deep lung with respiratory distress, ARDS, deep in the eye, the vision, uh, the optic nerve and the, and the, and the uh, retinitis, uh, deep skeletal muscle and deep peripheral nerve. So autopsies then prove now that Lyme disease has a more serious and more chronic uh, clinical presentation involving deep visceral sites, that's deep body sites. And uh, it is no longer confined to the meningitis or the lining around the brain, but it goes right into the brain, into the deepest areas of the brain and is responsible for brain disease. Dementias are an example of such deep brain involvement. And we have Alzheimer-like presentations with uh, deep Lyme disease. We have Lewy body-like presentations and Parkinson's disease like Lyme disease infections of the brain. These are all deep sites. Now tertiary, secondary, and primary borreliosis cases are one way of classifying uh, the type of Lyme disease that the patient presents. Tertiary is important because it is a disease which appears uh, very long after the patient has the tick bite. So it may be uh, decades, uh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after the tick bite, the patient may develop neurologic difficulties. In uh, this way, it is reminiscent of uh, syphilis, which could do exactly that. And that is that after exposure to the syphilis hierarchy, 10, 20, 30 years later, they would develop uh, dementia, heart problems, uh, aortic aneurysms. Those were tertiary manifestations of syphilis. And in like manner, there are tertiary manifestations of Lyme disease in the human nervous system, especially at deep sites. Uh, we have uh, the Lyme-focused autopsy to assist us in confirming that uh, tertiary Lyme involves deep sites. We uh, started with fetal deaths, and we found that the uh, organism, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, was present in deep visceral uh, tissues like the liver and brain, and we cultured it from the uh, deep uh, viscera of the fetus uh, in the autopsy studies. We used immunofluorescence and specific antibodies to show the spirochetes in the deep tissues, liver, brain, heart, and uh, kidney. So the autopsy helped very much in focusing attention on deep sites in addition to the previously um, uh, known uh, superficial sites for Lyme disease. In 1986, I uh, was at the Vienna conference and uh, I was presenting my fetal uh, death cases. Dr. Andrew Packner mentioned the word tertiary and then he mentioned the word uh, neuroborreliosis or brain uh, Lyme infection and it uh, stimulated me to uh, hypothesize that if uh, tertiary syphilis could cause uh, dementia, which is paresis, maybe uh, tertiary brain Lyme disease could cause dementia. And I wanted to go back and look at Alzheimer tissues. And I did. Uh, that work was done between 1986, uh, 85 to 86. And uh, the uh, results were positive. Uh, Borrelia was found in the autopsy brain tissue. Cultures were positive and I reported my results in the journal of the Medical, American Medical Association. Uh, the title is Borrelia in the Brains of Patients Dying with Dementia. I had two cases, and they were both antibody positive, 1986. These are the spirochetes that uh, grew from the um, brains of uh, the Alzheimer patients, and uh, you can see that they're uh, very characteristically spiral. Uh, this is the way they look in liquid medium. In tissue, there are uh, forces because tissue has uh, elastic fibers and uh, other connective tissue fibers which can stretch and distort the regular spiral to make it uh, look more worm-like uh, and only parts of the spiral remain. So that's why these worm-like uh, structures are existing in tissue. In addition, I discovered uh, in one of my Alzheimer brains for the first time very first time that a cystic form of Borrelia 
was present in the Alzheimer brain tissue, and I'll show you that in a minute. But this is a cystic form of Borrelia with monoclonal antibody, H9724 from Dr. Barber. Notice that it is uh, somewhat round, but it is wrinkled. And it's wrinkled because it has lost fluid. Uh, before it had lost the fluid, it was probably uh, smooth like a basketball. Uh, but as it lost fluid, uh, it uh, became wrinkled and uh, it has uh, that uh, wrinkled appearance. So evidence uh, point number two for Alzheimer's uh, um, like Lyme is that monoclonal antibodies prove that the culture of spirochetes were Borrelia and the spirochetes in the brain were Borrelia. These monoclonal antibodies from Dr. Alan Barber uh, generously provided for my research and for the research of others. I uh, subsequently reported another uh, case, uh, and this was the case where I found the spirochetal cyst form. This was in 1988 in the New York Academy of Sciences. This is what the cyst looked like in the Alzheimer brain. And you notice there's a little wrinkle here, just like the wrinkle that I showed you before. I did a fingerprint preparation, and I used the monoclonal antibody to stain the fingerprint preparation. And the form that uh, took the antibody and glowed brightly was this form, which is the cystic form of Borrelia, com uh, coming out of this tissue and uh, lying flat on the side like a fingerprint would. So this proves that uh, this structure is a Borrelia cyst, and uh, other uh, Borrelia cysts were cultivated from uh, fresh autopsy brain tissue. Dr. Judith McClossey in the years 1993 to 2014 present has uh, done her own studies uh, and we have really not talked about uh, how those studies were designed. She designed them on her own. She came up with this concept of uh, possibility of chronic Borrelia in brain might uh, have a role in producing some Alzheimer's disease. Uh, she de developed evidence for this and published her first paper in 1993. Uh, she has since uh, continued to publish many papers uh, right up to year 2014, and her work is recognized internationally. Uh, she also has a category of uh, Alzheimer's that may, is, may be related to oral treponemes, not syphilis treponemes, but oral treponemes, like oral cavity uh, spirochetes, which get into the brain and produce Alzheimer's disease. Advanced DNA probes specifically designed to recognize Borrelia DNA uh, were developed by me uh, to get away from the whole antibody uh, detection methods, uh, which are fine, but uh, which in uh, the 21st century take second place to DNA probes. So uh, I developed specific DNA probes that only react with Borrelia DNA and do not ever react with human DNA. <clears throat> Here, an example of an Alzheimer plaque with my special DNA probe, and the plaque is grow, uh, glowing uh, green. Here is uh, brain tissue. Does not take the plaque um, of the probe. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, probes are very helpful in identifying forms of the spirochete, which are present in the tissue. And no matter what form you see with the specific DNA probe, it is Borrelia DNA. So it can be spiral, it can be snake-like, it can be granular, it can be cystic, and it can be this form too, which is a form we'll talk about uh, soon, and that is the biofilm community form. I uh, also used ex total brain extracts of Alzheimer's brain tissue and amplified uh, the uh, human uh, Alzheimer's DNA with specific probes to amplify Borrelia uh, DNA and I, I found uh, very sharp bands in uh, seven cases. Uh, here are some of them, uh, which uh, were then cut out of the gel. Uh, they were uh, positioned at the site where I expected them to be. That means that they were a specific size designed and de uh, determined by the DNA probes that I used. Uh, these went cut out of the gel and sent to a DNA sequencing laboratory showed that uh, the DNA that was with, within these uh, bands was Borrelia DNA by DNA sequencing. That's A, T, G, C, that's a DNA code. 
Each of us has our own DNA code. Borrelia has its specific DNA code. And uh, DNA sequencing is the most elegant way of proving that the DNA that you're looking at is either human or non-human. And if non-human, it's either Borrelia or some other microbe. So DNA sequencing proved that all these bands had Borrelia DNA in them. And that was what I intended to amplify with my PCR method. This is a higher a magnification of those uh, bands and the gels. Uh, all of the DNA probes cut out of the gels, sent to the sequencing lab, and they came back with the result of Borrelia DNA. Uh, these uh, specimens came from the Harvard Brain Bank. So all of the cases that were um, subjected to this analysis were Alzheimer's diseases, Alzheimer's disease, as diagnosed by the Harvard University faculty, and they uh, placed tissue in the brain bank for researchers to examine. Uh, these then produced DNA. This DNA sequence analysis showed it was Borrelia DNA. Seven of 10 cases in this category. Uh, the sequences have since been uh, examined carefully at the National Gene Bank, Gen Bank, and have been accepted and are now on deposit for everyone to uh, look at in Gen Bank and around the world. I uh, then uh, used uh, DNA probes specific for Borrelia to localize spirochetes to Alzheimer's tissue injury areas. So uh, this is an example of uh, a red labeled uh, DNA probe. Um, and these red uh, areas of staining are the DNA probe binding to Borrelia DNA in an Alzheimer neuron. The nucleus is down here. So uh, all the DNA normally in a cell is within the nucleus except if you have an infection with a DNA containing um, life, life form, and there are DNA viruses and there are bacteria that have DNA. Here we have Borrelia DNA in the cytoplasm producing round structures, small, uh, medium, and large, sharply uh, demarcated from the adjacent human uh, cytoplasm, which is yellow. So uh, this is a sharp definition of Borrelia infection in the uh, granular uh, vacuolar bodies. Uh, these are granular Borrelia spirochetes, and we'll discuss how granular Borrelia spirochetes look and how they come to be uh, uh, in a few slides, uh, uh, which I will present. Alzheimer's disease is um, really a disease that was described uh, by Alzheimer's between 1902 and 1906, he died uh, young uh, in 1915 of, uh, I think, rheumatic heart disease. He was a very, uh, very sick man uh, during his lifetime. He recognized uh, first that tangles uh, were present in the brain of one patient who had uh, early onset dementia, and it was a woman. And uh, the, he published his case. He also noticed that there were uh, these structures, which are plaques. So tangles plus plaques were for Alzheimer's, the uh, hallmarks of his disease. Now he only published two cases in his lifetime uh, and two cases do not impress anybody uh, in terms of uh, today's uh, rules and regulations for what counts in science and what is dismissed as just anecdote. Uh, however, uh, the uh, disease is now uh, the fastest growing uh, disease, one of the fastest growing diseases on the planet. And for many years between his uh, death, 1915, and uh, the early 1980s, nobody diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, it was just uh, thought to be, uh, if you have dementia, it's because of your old age, and therefore it's called senile dementia. Uh, this panel shows uh, the granular bodies uh, the uh, round or red bodies here with this stain, not, t not a DNA stain in this case, just a red stain, uh, another red stain. And uh, these are disease neurons. The nucleus is here, so all the DNA should be here. Uh, and these are uh, red bodies that are called granular acular bodies or GVBs. People are coming to now accept that uh, the presence of GVBs uh, in diseased uh, Alzheimer's brain tissue is another important uh, evidence of tissue injury. 
not uh, defining evidence unique for Alzheimer's disease, as are the uh, tangles. Um, and of course, the plaques, although interesting, are not a defining uh, a hallmark of the disease because many people will die with plaques in their brain and not have dementia. So if you don't have dementia and they find plaques uh, like this in your brain, uh, you cannot make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you have GVBs uh, and uh, you have tangles, uh, then I think that uh, strengthens the possibility that uh, your disease is an Alzheimer dementia. More uh, examples of how plaques look in uh, autopsy brain. You can see that they are small, uh, medium, and large. Some of them have a central core of amyloid. This is a burned out plaque where only the amyloid uh, core remains. Now, I designed Borrelia-specific DNA probes to uh, uh, exclusively bind uh, to uh, Borrelia DNA. And I found that in Alzheimer brain, they exclusively bind to the plaques. And here's an example of a, uh, an Alzheimer plaque uh, with my probe. And only Borrelia DNA gl glows green. So all of this green material is Borrelia DNA. And this is a tissue adjacent brain tissue. It does not have Borrelia DNA. Uh, this uh, also has conspicuous black areas that all, almost seem to interconnect with one another uh, and almost seem to recall a system of waterways or canals. I believe that these are water channels, uh, water channel canals. And I believe that this entire plaque structure containing water channel canals and uh, being marked uh, very clearly by Borrelia DNA is a biofilm of Borrelia because biofilms of Borrelia have uh, abundant uh, Borrelia DNA uh, either in living organisms or uh, extruded from uh, dead organisms and forming part of the matrix or the glue that holds the community together. And they also have water channels that uh, connect uh, from the inside to the outside and allow nutrients and uh, waste material to either uh, come in or exit from the biofilm community, promoting its general health and welfare. Granular vacuolar degeneration, uh, in my view, is that the granules inside the dying uh, neuron mark it for death. Uh, they are granules in the cytoplasm, and uh, they are not in the nucleus. They have a vacuole, and the vacuole is an empty space. Here's the granule. These are from the work of Dr. Binder one of the premier uh, uh, research uh, neuropathologists, uh, Dr. Binder's lab is in Chicago. So these are electron microscopic examinations of the vacuoles and the granules or the GVB, granular vacuolar bodies. These are uh, the same under uh, lower magnification. They look like a bubble with a dot inside. They're always in the cytoplasm, never in the nucleus. These two cells have no GVBs. They have a nucleus and they have a cytoplasm and there are no uh, GVBs in this cell or this cell. All these uh, images come from Alzheimer's disease tissue from the lab of Dr. Bender in Chicago. Now, how do we get from a spiral form, this is a spirochete, to granular forms like this, small, medium, and large? Well, think of the uh, spirochete as a pearl necklace. If you unstring a pearl necklace, the pearls will be released and uh, you'll have round, small, medium, and large pearls. And they are no longer connected so that they don't form a structure that you can trace back to a spirochete or a necklace, but they exist as separate units. It turns out that each of these uh, granular bodies contains DNA and is surrounded by a membrane. And each of the uh, granules has enough DNA to reproduce in culture this spirochete, the entire spirochete. So if you have, um, let's say, a short spirochete which ends here, begins here, and ends up here, you can have, when it breaks up into granules, 30 granules from that small area of a spiral. If you have a longer spirochete like this one, and it breaks up into granules, you can have 60 granules. So it's a biological multiplier effect of infection. This is a, a spirochete that has uh, been in culture for uh, about a year. And uh, you can see that uh, it is uh, still 
uh, somewhat uh, curvy, snake-like, but uh, no longer spiral per se. It has a granule here, it has granules here, and it has some sausage uh, structures here and here. Uh, this is a rounded structure. And uh, when the spirochete then ultimately dissolves and all these are released into the fluid, uh, they will be uh, granular forms of the spirochete with the DNA uh, necessary. Now, how do you get from a sausage uh, to a round circle? Uh, there's a law of physics which says that the most efficient relationship between the surface area and uh, volume of a body is a sphere. So if you have a surface area of a sausage uh, with a uh, volume inside of it, when it is released into the uh, liquid medium, uh, the corset, uh, more or less, that holds it together in a sausage form is then relaxed and the uh, sausage will uh, become a sphere. And that is the way that you have large caliber granules, small caliber granules, all from one spirochete. So Borrelia specific DNA probes prove uh, that Borrelia DNA is inside the granules of granular vacuolar degeneration. So here's our granular vacuolar degeneration, not with DNA probes, but with a, stand, with a standard uh, red stain. And this is uh, the uh, granular degeneration uh, in a fingerprint preparation. The nucleus of the cell is here. And you can see that the granules come up to the edge of the nucleus, but do not go inside of it. They come in small medium and large sizes. And these are DNA probes for the red marker stain. Uh, the yellow is the cytoplasm. So the DNA uh, of the infecting organism, which is Borrelia, the granular form, exists in the cytoplasm of the neuron. And the neuron here is marked for death. The nucleus does not have any Borrelia staining. So here again, spiral to granular transformation granules in another neuron with a green stain. The nucleus is over here. The granules come up to the edge of the nucleus, but do not go inside of it. Uh, there's, there's, there are many, many granules. They overlap. Uh, this is a DNA uh, probe demonstrating that Borrelia DNA is present in the granules of granular vacuolar degeneration. Uh, another neuron with similar studies, only fewer of these granules in the cytoplasm. Uh, the nucleus is here, no, no granules inside the nucleus. DNA probes specific for Borrelia. Now the tangles uh, have been uh, a standard part of the definition of Alzheimer's disease since the time of Alzheimer's and remain so today, highly specific for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease as opposed to other forms of dementia. Dr. Kidd of the United, of the United Kingdom refined our understanding of the structure of the uh, tangles of Alzheimer's and uh, has uh, produced uh, this sort of structure for the tangles. I still uh, am puzzled by the, uh, the way that uh, these actually form from uh, liquid to a solid uh, fiber, but it is a fiber nonetheless. It's a pathology. Uh, it's a fiberopathy or fiber pathology and it is emblematic of Alzheimer's disease. These uh, take the tau, a phosphorylated tau uh, protein uh, stain. Judith McClossey, again, uh, premier Alzheimer and Borrelia and spirochetal uh, dementia researcher, has used 16S Borrelia DNA as specific for DNA analysis to localize Borrelia to sites of Alzheimer injury and Alzheimer tissue. Uh, Dr. McClossey, again, has used immune stains to localize bacterial cell wall, antibodies to bacterial cell wall, uh, to Alzheimer plaques. Now, bacterial cell wall does not involve the structure of any of the normal human tissues. So if you have bacterial cell wall in an Alzheimer plaque, that's very, very exquisite as evidence that bacteria were present at the uh, formation of the Alzheimer plaque. So it's a very good uh, uh, among her excellent studies. And she has so many excellent studies, which we will uh, describe. Dr. Uh, McClossey is also uh, used in vitro, that's in glass, in test tube, cultures of uh, pure Borrelia, 
uh, and uh, mix them with uh, tissue cultures of normal human neurons. Uh, so the neurons in uh, tissue culture are swimming in a liquid medium and they're healthy and alive. And you add laboratory culture, living Borrelia, growing rapidly. And what happens? The uh, co-cultured uh, spirochetes and uh, neurons show that the Borrelia spirochetes penetrate the tissue culture cells. They go inside the cytoplasm of the neuron in the laboratory in the test tube. Here's such a, a neuron, and you can see that the spirochete is penetrated into the cytoplasm of the tissue cultured neuron. Normally, uh, there would be nothing here except healthy cytoplasm, but now we have an infecting organism inside the cytoplasm, a diseased neuron due to infection with the Alzheimer, um, uh, with the Borrelia, and uh, this sequence of events, I think, happens in Alzheimer's disease as well. I have a, um, an imprint of uh, an Alzheimer autopsy brain uh, to further uh, firm up this association. This is a fingerprint preparation, so the entire cell lies flat like a fried egg. You can see great detail inside the cell. Here is the nucleus, and there's nothing going on that we can see in the nucleus. It's abnormal. Here is a spirochete, uh, Borrelia spirochete, uh, with uh, immune stain for Borrelia inside the cytoplasm of a human uh, neuron from the case of Alzheimer's disease. It does not involve the nucleus. It involves the cytoplasm. It's a spirochete, just like Dr. McClossey has shown, that has penetrated from the outside and set up residence inside the cytoplasm. Dr. McClossey has also used atomic force microscopy. This is a 21st century tool for the evaluation of um, unfixed tissue. And she's proven that cystic Borrelia exists in Alzheimer brain tissue. Now remember, I'm the one that put cystic Borrelia in the map uh, back in 1988. Uh, Dr. McClossey now with 21st century tools has shown with atomic force microscopy that cystic Borrelia forms do exist in Alzheimer brain tissue. Uh, the abbreviation for atomic force microscopy is AFM. So she has AFM evidence of cystic Borrelia in Alzheimer tissue. Uh, Dr. Shapi and I have worked on biofilms of Borrelia. Biofilms are communities of Borrelia. Uh, they exist in mammalian tissues that have chronic Borrelia infections. Uh, biofilms are a protective mechanism so that if um, microbes encounter a hostile environment such as the human immune system or antibiotics in the blood or uh, extremes of pH or other adverse uh, chemical environments, which would ordinarily kill the microbes, they form biofilms, and biofilms are communities to protect the microbes from dying off. They're a protective mechanism. And the Borrelia then that form biofilms, just like 99% of all microbes on the planet, which also form biofilms when subjected to extreme conditions, biofilms of Borrelia uh, are present in mammalian tissues and chronic Borrelia infections. This is what a biofilm looks like reared in the test tube. Spirochetes, uh, some at the edge, still visible, but most of the uh, forms are the granular forms. And then the gray uh, and membranous material in between the dot-like granular forms is the matrix. The matrix is a gel-like, glue-like substance, which is uh, the remnants of once living, now dead members of the community. They contribute their proteins, their DNA, and all of their guts to form this protective um, uh, slime-like material which surrounds the entire community and prevents it from death. This is a biofilm of Borrelia in the skin. It's from the Acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans lesion. That, you will recall, is the tertiary form of Borrelia in the human skin, well accepted in Europe. We don't think we have Acrodermatitis in the United States is probably due to the type of strain of Borrelia that they have, which is different from the U.S. strain. In any event, uh, we have uh, dot-like uh, uh, areas within the biofilm, uh, which are the granular forms. We don't have any spiral forms at all here. And then we have pink stuff to red stuff, which is the matrix, which holds and protects uh, and surrounds the members of the biofilm and prevents them from being killed off. So. Tertiary 
skin, Borrelia, acrodermatitis, biofilm, biofilm community, multiple non-spiral Borrelia, most all of them granular, surrounded by a matrix, which contains DNA. And the little dot-like areas also contain DNA of the Borrelia, all Borrelia, all the time. In the tick gut, we can see examples of cystic forms and other modified forms uh, which can perform uh, can uh, form uh, biofilm communities in the gut of the tick, uh, the exoded tick, which transmits the disease. These uh, gray structures are the cystic forms to highlight them. They've colored some of them blue, so that you can see that the cysts vary in size from small to medium to large. These are much, much bigger than the granular forms that I described before. This is actually a, a black uh, cross-section cylinder of uh, one of the uh, Borrelia uh, uh, spirochetes, which is outside of the tick gut. So uh, these are cystic forms inside the gut and more cystic forms, many, many of them inside the gut. The gut is a hostile environment. The gut has enzymes. The enzymes are there to digest protein to make food for the, per, for the uh, organism, the, uh, the tick in this case, to sustain it, to nourish it. And uh, the biofilms are there to protect the uh, spirochetes from becoming food for the nutrition of the tick. Now, my hypothesis uh, is that the biofilms that we've shown for Borrelia uh, are the structural explanation for plaques of Alzheimer's disease. That is to say, Alzheimer plaques are biofilm communities of Borrelia. Uh, this statement then I'm going to uh, offer some structural evidence for to back up and support. And uh, you will see some images which uh, tell you why I believe that statement to be true. The plaques, Alzheimer's, biofilm communities of Borrelia. This is from the uh, Wellcome image collection and has been used in a publication from the Scripps La Jolla Institute in connection with their work on Alzheimer's disease. You can see that the plaque all by itself is surrounded by brain tissue. So the plaque is in light um, aqua. Uh, there is a rounded structure here that's a cystic structure to my, to my view. There are linear structures. Uh, there are uh, straight lines. Uh, those uh, could be uh, spirochetal profiles or other profiles, amyloid fibers, uh, I'm not sure. But we expect to find amyloid within uh, Alzheimer plaques. But uh, there are some uh, areas here that are uh, round, uh, black uh, areas that remind me of the canals of the biofilm and for that reason I think that this entire plaque traversed by uh, canals which enable fluid to get in and out is a Borrelia biofilm and to uh, further add some uh, structure to that I've enlarged the uh, image here so that uh, the, only the bottom part is enlarged. And you can see that these are indeed black empty spaces within the uh, Alzheimer plaque. They come in small, medium, and large. And uh, in further enlargement, you can see that they are somewhat heterogeneous, but uh, clearly very close in uh, uh, the uh, architecture to the water canal spaces of Borrelia biofilms, uh, which exist in test tube preparations. Here's a biofilm with a water space. Here's another biofilm with a smaller water space, an early biofilm with large water spaces. This is a mixed biofilm. Each of the black areas is a water space or water channel. It's a solid area of a community of organisms which needs to protect itself from hostile assaults it has nutrients coming in and waste material going out through these black spaces. This is the Alzheimer plaque once again with the DNA stain. Only DNA from Borrelia stains 
rain doesn't stain here, it's black. The black stains bright. Uh, there are varying degrees of green. And then there are uh, this uh, system of uh, black areas, which look like at higher power interconnecting channels, which uh, are like the water channels that you see in uh, laboratory prepared uh, pure cultures of Borrelia and test tube. Here, another Alzheimer plaque with similar areas of black uh, staining consistent with water channels uh, going uh, through the plaque. All the uh, uh, roundness of the plaque is there. It's a classical Alzheimer plaque. And the green is uh, DNA from the Borrelia. Only D DNA of Borrelia stains green here. This is brain tissue, which does not have Borrelia DNA. It does not stain green. So these two plaques both have water canals. Uh, this plaque has what I think are water canals. This is an Alzheimer plaque with a conventional stain. This is an Alzheimer plaque with a Borrelia DNA stain. This is a water channel. This is a water channel. These are water channels. Water channels plus DNA, sharply circumscribed. All of these come together under a nice definition of a biofilm community. Community of organisms surrounded by DNA and other proteins that were once living, now dead, that form a matrix to hold a community together and prevent it from assault from antibodies and antibiotics. A biofilm community with water channels, water channels, water channels, water channels, water channels. All of these are communities. Now, uh, another way to look at water uh, channels is to uh, look at uh, more uh, uh, aged biofilm communities. And you can see that uh, the water channels here form a sort of a curly Q. They're curved uh, like the sewer system. Uh, and that in the cartoon, you can see that uh, the solid areas uh, have spaces and the water is going through the solid uh, to uh, through the canal system to enter and exit from the biofilm community. Water channels, both nutrients and waste material. So here we are, water channels, empty spaces, in an Alzheimer plaque, biofilm-like. And if you look carefully here, you can see that although the silver has stained the plaque brown, there are areas of yellow coming through. And those yellow areas are equivalent to the black areas here. That's the empty space that allows you to see the underlying yellow normal brain tissue through the center of the brown staining Alzheimer plaque. It's just not enlarged as much as this black area is. So these also water channels going through an Alzheimer plaque using a silver stain. So uh, the, the concept of biofilms is attractive because they come in small, medium, and large. Alzheimer plaques come in small, medium, and large. Uh, biofilms have water channels. Alzheimer plaques have water channel-like spaces. And there they are again. And therefore, I think that uh, this explains the architecture of the mysterious Alzheimer plaque. You're allowed to have other chemical constituents inside the plaque. Amyloid is a marker of chronic inflammation. Biofilms happen in chronic inflammation. So the amyloid does not take away in any way from the definition of Alzheimer plaques as Borrelia biofilm communities. It's a chronic infection of the brain. So a quick review of the spirochete uh, uh, various profiles. Here's a profile which most people would recognize as spiroketal, has a wavy uh, corkscrew or so, sort of undulating form. That is not the only legitimate form. This is in liquid culture. Remember, if you put it into tissue, uh, these will stretch out and become more uh, wavy and uh, less corkscrew-like in form. This is the uh, second very, very legitimate form, the cystic form, all of the permutations. You notice the cysts contain granules, and these granules are the same granules as we uh, saw uh, coming out of the center of the axis of the uh, 
spiral form. So granules in cystic forms, granule in spiral form. Some of the granules are small, medium, and large. Many granules, cystic forms, various sizes of cystic forms, as shown in the tick. And finally, the DNA. This is a DNA distribution uh, with special stain acridine orange. The DNA stains uh, green to uh, yellow. The RNA stains red. And at points of where it will segment, it will break up into the pearls or the granules, and each of these will be single and separate for a period of time. Here they are, the membrane has dissolved away, uh, but they are still close enough to each other that you can connect the dots and see where the spirochete used to be. Just like it is here, you can connect the dots. In order to understand the concepts that I've talked to you about today, you have to be able to connect the dots. Can you connect the dots? This is an uh, old uh, culture with a very aged spirochete. Connect the dots. And you wind up with this, which is a spirochete that is not segmented. Or you wind up with this, which is a spirochete that is even earlier in its life history and has not uh, broken up into segments and then into granules. You must be able to connect the dots in order for all of this to make sense. And it is a very compelling argument because we're using DNA probes specific for Borrelia as our evidence. We're not depending on antibodies. So DNA probes are the best stain on the planet for detection of microbes a uh, parting shot, if we take fresh Alzheimer tissue, roll it like a fingerprint across the slide, hit it with a DNA probe, we wind up with an uncoiled Borrelia spirochete with pointed ends, undulating form. These are the cystic forms. The dark black is proteins of brain which do not contain Borrelia DNA. So only Borrelia DNA is going to glow dark green so there's Borrelia DNA here, 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 and here. All the rest of it is uh, negative. An Alzheimer case from Harvard Brain Bank, their case number 616. Now we ratified our autopsy studies. Uh, Dr. Uh, McClossey's work ratifies uh, the work that I've done. My work ratifies the work that she's done. We've worked independently. We do not exchange um, uh, notes. Uh, we do not use identical techniques. We do not work in the same country. Uh, we worked independently over the years and we maintain our independence because that is the way that ratification proceeds in science. If you work independently, you come up with conclusions. If the conclusions are essentially identical, then each of the laboratories has ratified the findings of the other laboratories. We hope that this process will lead us to um, discovery of more Lyme-related infections, more disease uh, processes that involve deep, deep organs, more explanations for fatalities in adults and fetuses, which are autopsy verified and which can be traced back to Borrelia infection. There is absolute demand for positive tissue controls, and you can make tissue controls by taking your plasma, mixing it with pure culture of Borrelia, making sure that none of the plasma uh, from your blood is mixed with white blood cells or platelets, but it's just pure liquid plasma. Mix the plasma with the Borrelia, clot it with thrombin, and it becomes a ropey tissue-like equivalent. You can cut hundreds of positive control slides, and the only thing in those slides will be fibrin, and Borrelia spirochetes in any form. Studying these preparations, you will develop an atlas of Borrelia morphologies, and you'll be surprised to see how many different morphologies are in this tissue control. Uh, they're not all textbook corkscrews. There are granular forms, there are cystic forms, uh, there are fragmented forms, and uh, these all help you to understand what Borrelia can look like when you're looking at diseased tissue, which might contain Borrelia, and you're using DNA probes. 
I also recommend an apprentice program for pathologists who have never uh, done a spirochetal focused on a human autopsy so that they can learn some of the techniques from more uh, seasoned uh, and experienced uh, specialist pathologists such as myself and Dr. McClossey who have done these uh, procedures successfully. Antibody negative or biologically positive Borreliosis. This is a vexing category, but uh, it now includes Miyamoto infections, which can very closely mimic uh, the Bergdorferi family of Borrelia. Miyamoto is a problem because it's a relapsing fever Borrelia. It's probably been among us for many, many years. We just didn't recognize it. There's no blood test for it. It can produce a condition which has spirochetes, but will not react in Lyme blood tests because Miyamoto does not react in Lyme blood tests. European type infections also may be missed in U.S. manufactured test kits, which are designed to pick up USA type Borrelia. Another category of difficulty is viable but non-cultivatable Borrelia strains. These are strains that uh, don't grow in the laboratory very well, but can cause disease in a human. Because we can't grow them in the laboratory, we can't manufacture test materials or slides or Western blots from these viable but non-cultivatable Borrelias. They still cause disease. So you can see them under the microscope, but you may not be able to get a positive blood test result. And some of the newly described strains of formerly non-cultivatable, but now cultivatable, are Americanum, Andersoni, Curtinbachi, Bassetti, Australian strains, Borrelia Chinese strains, Turkish strains, and South American strains. All newcomers to the Borrelia pathology universe. So our wish list for the 21st century, we hope that uh, people will pick up the baton, continue to study Borrelia, continue to study diseases with pathology tools, molecular tools, 21st century tools. We know that there will be new disease associations uh, described by such uh, 21st century scientists. We know that new co-infections will be described and, and better uh, characterized. And we hope that treatments will be designed to interrupt or to eliminate Borrelia infection from people who suffer from it, no matter whether it's an early infection or a very chronic chronic late, late infection, such as uh, was the uh, case with Dr. David Martz when he was cured of his uh, ugaric like disease due to Borrelia infection. He was cured by antibiotics, long-term treatment over a number of years. He is now running a clinic to help other people who have an ALS-like illness. So beginning of lifelong learning, and I bid you adieu uh, with the French Borrelia Sans Frontier, which means Borrelia without limits or geographic boundaries. Thank you very much for your kind attention.